It's the next level. Hey, my name is Ross Marquand and I play Red Skull. You are listening to Panels to Pixels podcast. Check it out. In the beginning, there was only one. A single black infinitude. Then the infinitude found release. And finally, the darkness broke. Filling it with life. With the multiverse. Every existence multiplied by possibility and spread out before space and time in infinite measure. Civilizations rose and fell and rose again across reality's grasping expanse. Life, a precious gift persevering in the face of every obstacle until finally the age of heroes was born. Chaos. The constant enemy of life, kept at bay by champions from across the multiverse. Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. I'm Mark, and Happy New Year! And I'm Steve. And Happy New Year, yeah. It is episode 75, Mark. Can you believe we've made it to 75? We're 25 away from 100. Yeah. That's crazy. Dude. Yeah, we've, wow, we've been doing this almost three years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah this is fun. It's just wild to me that uh, uh, when I started looking at that and realized that we're on episode 75, you know. So uh, I, I'm excited. Maybe, uh, you know, depending on what we do here in the future, we'll have to see where episode 100 hits and if we can do something special for it exactly hopefully yeah we'll we'll do something special get a bunch of people on yeah <laughs> yeah but why don't you let the listeners know what we're talking about this week mark yeah so we didn't really we gave some information on the last episode when we came out of over a week ago and basically on this episode we wanted to discuss the cwdc universe crossover show which is crisis on infinite earths or for cw it's called infinite crisis Parts one through three. So this special episode will follow a slightly different format. Uh, I have a uh, knowledge about the DC Comics run of this story and the CW DC Universe shows to some degree. Uh, I'm not a huge DC comic book fan, but I do know exactly certain things that have happened in the actual comic. And Steve only knows what he watched in these episodes because he came in <laughs> flat out. I don't know. I don't watch these shows. <laughs> I, you know, I tried. I've admitted, you know, I tried watching Arrow. And uh, but, you know, now with with watching these crossover, these episodes, I may try to go back and see what I can pick up from The Flash or uh, Legends of Tomorrow or, you know, any of them. I'm not sure. Which ones? Legends kind of intrigues me because um, the time travel aspect. I've always been a big fan of time travel stuff. And, oh yeah. Uh, when I some of the characters that they interacted with on the the episodes that we had here were were really cool, and I want to see those characters again. So I'm I'm kind of excited. At least uh, Legends is the one that intrigues me. I know it's it's ending. I think next season or or something like yeah. that. Yeah. But uh, it intrigues me to check it out. The Constantine, even though it only ran. For one season, that kind of intrigues me. I want to maybe maybe try to find it somewhere or something. So yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely a good watch. If you didn't watch those shows, you could always go back. There's a CW app. If you got an Apple TV or Roku or something, you could actually go back and watch certain episodes. I don't think all seasons. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'll have to find out what streaming services, whether it's Netflix or Hulu, or has got these other these other shows uh, on it. Because the CW app for me is a little hit and miss. Yeah. What was your first take on the initial episode? So, so the first time I watched these episodes, I really enjoyed them. I, I didn't, I didn't get too confused. I, I, I got a little bit confused about some things with some characters that look very similar to characters from the Marvel universe 
And, but for the most part, I was, it was pretty straightforward. And then, uh, the second time watching it, I had some, some questions pop up that uh, I wanted to pose to you to see if, if you can answer them or, uh, if there, there is an answer to them. And, and, uh, I've just got like two or three here real quick. If you want to, uh, if you wouldn't mind, uh, helping me out and maybe helping out some of the, the listeners. And the, the first one I had is just how are they traveling? How, how are they? I know there's like a comment that the Brainiac guy makes about our flux capacitors won't have enough power if we stay here or whatever he called it, our adjuster. And then like one of the characters had like a little device in his hand. And then a couple of the characters had like, it looked like they, they just had a power to move through these universes. But is, has it ever been established that there's one, like, how are they doing this? Because at one point in, in that first episode, they actually travel through time, not just through multiverses. So how are they accomplishing this? Well, to start off, the monitor is transporting them for the most part. Okay. Okay, that was the other thing I, I was I did see that in that in the end of the the flash ep, you know the first episode where he zaps all of them out, which that was a cool scene, and we'll get to it when we get to that episode, but where he kind of you know transports yeah. them all so for the most part, the monitor is the one who's uh, think of him as uh, in okay. the Marvel universe as the good watcher, and there's mm-hmm. an evil watcher, which would be the anti monitor. And right, uh, right. he is doing battle with the anti monitor who wants to destroy all these Earths. And all yeah. these Earths are trying to protect themselves, and that's how it is in the comic book itself. So he enlists, like, the Harbinger. And that's actually in the mm-hmm. comic, but it's a different person altogether, different character. Right. So in this, they use what characters they have within the CW universe. And she is the one that's also arranging transportation because she's granted all these powers. Now, mind you, she is right, married, right. and I think her character, because I don't watch Arrow, she was married to Diggle, who is in Arrow, and they thought she was transported to what, what the legends do, which is within time. So she uh, is granted this, like, office job (laughs) to monitor the time. So that's how she's able to move. But she's been granted powers by the monitor. So she was grabbing these people for the monitor as well as the monitor getting involved. Right. Right. Okay. And there is a device. And then, of course, there's these ships, I guess, that that travel through space and – Yes. Multiverses as well, so there is there is some uh, technology that they're using to do this as well. Yes, uh, you know, and I'll, I'll elaborate with that. So in Legends of Tomorrow, they were taken, and I think what was it, Flash season two or three, where they were created as the Legends. Now, mind you, think of like the Avengers, but the really bad version of the Avengers, and they took all the characters from the DC universe that were either not mentioned or forgotten about in time that are expendable. And they were put together by one character, and he has a time machine because he comes so far in the future that he has seen everything, but he wants to correct time because there are people that are impeding on that time. So that's how the legends become. Hmm. So they have the wave rider, which goes through time. Now, mind you, within that show... Keep in mind, listeners, if you haven't watched Legends, it's a whirlwind of fun because it's mostly comedy more than anything. Okay. I found it more humorous, but they put a lot of time stuff in there that is amazing. And what they have done within time with all these characters that you never thought you would ever see, you they were all banded together. They're kind of an oddball gang. Okay. And they use that particular means to get around to within uh, the actual final crisis as well. Interesting. So, and then the other question I had is just the, like some of the numbers on the universes, I understand it's for the audience for us to recognize that it's a different earth, but within the shows, the characters use numbers also and they're like oh you're from earth 99 and and i'm from Earth 38 and i'm from earth Mm -hmm. one and i'm from earth two and i'm from earth who like is there anything within the show that established those numbers was that the monitor or is there some like futuristic council somewhere that's like numbering all the multiverses i think it was the monitor that created those numbers but throughout the flash they've actually 
encountered that. So to give you a little bit of information, Harrison Wells, who was the doctor, Dr. Harrison Wells in The Flash, who mentored Barry, who is The Flash. So he literally uh, wasn't who he was, but became an evil person and then there's multiple versions of him there was a Har harrison wells on earth but he died in an explosion but the reverse flash took his place mentored barry and within that barry was able to go amongst all these different yeah i still earths. it just it just it just bugs me that because if like i was a character in this show i would be like no my earth is number one i don't care <laughs> my earth is number one how how can your earth be number one and and why does my earth have to be 99 and can't my earth be you know whatever 69 i want to be earth 69 or whatever yeah you know, exactly um it, it just seems a little it just seems a little arbitrary and you know i, I guess they don't really Probably it's it, a way to name them, I think. And Harrison Wells from uh, Earth 2 was the one that actually helped out Barry for the most part because after the original Harrison Wells, spoilers everybody, but you should really be watching Flash, he was the uh, reverse Flash. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's 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 all. I mean, I I I, I get yeah. It. I just I just wanted to know where the so, numbers came from. But and he he had actually explained that. <laughs> he actually explained that in the the Flash series. So within the Flash series, you actually saw a different version of Harrison Wells coming to help out Barry because Earth Two Harrison Wells wanted to go back to Earth Two. And then he got other people that were very similar in genius of him from other Earths that are different from the multiverse. So they would come in and they were all eccentric. They were all strange and funny, which uh, uh, added to the humor and the camp of Flash, which I love. But also they had some serious aspects within those episodes that made the the series of the flash very cool to watch okay. and that's why i watch it all the time because yeah, yeah no, I, I, I just love I, the I idea barry the series is. yeah I, I just i just was that was just an interesting question to me so but what about you what was your what, what is your initial take of just the the, the just this mini series this crossover event well i love the idea of the crossover event the uh they do that they've been doing this for the past three years so this is the third one Last year's was very monumentous, and it was very good, and I, I enjoyed it. So, with this one, this is like the utmost one to watch, because this is what Ben and his partner on DC Primetime have been building up all this time from the CW, since they've been covering it all this time. We're just briefing over this, mm -hmm. and we're just giving our our look and our outtakes of it but you know my feeling is is that this is the penultimate of all these shows and i think after this we're going to get a couple of new shows and two shows will probably disappear after this yeah, yeah. because uh it, it's got to end certain ones certain ones that are not working within the ratings or they're not doing well based on viewership but yeah. Uh, the, I think the ideal aspect of this, and it's very much carries into the idea of what the initial Crisis on Infinite Earths did in the comics, because DC saw that, and this is my first outcome and thought of what's going on within uh, what they're doing with the show. So DC initially saw that they had way too many storylines going across several different versions of these characters over the years. So they created multiverse and the multiverse means that you could have your own plane of existence and you could have superpowers as Barry Allen or whoever, but you could have another earth that would be like earth three or four. And it would be, let's say instead of Barry Allen being the flash, it would be Jake Garrick with the, metal helmet with the wings and he could speed fast and he was the flash in his universe or his earth or you could have another version of barry allen and like let's say earth seven or eight and that barry allen would look very different and then have the same thing but different outcomes in his life that made him the flash so they saw so many things getting all mixed up and all manipulated and created so that they wanted to destroy everything and 
give somebody uh like some sort of big bad almost like Thanos or uh Darkseid and just destroy it all and put it all onto one particular earth. And then later on DC changed that. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, and that's we were we talked about this I think uh, before, but you know like Marvel did the same thing. Marvel had like multiple comic books of Spider-Man like in one Spider-Man yes. he might be married to Gwen Stacy and another Spider-Man he was married to uh Mary Parker or, or yeah, Mary um whatever her last name was before they got married. Mary Jane Mary, Watson. Mary Jane, thank you. Um you know, and so they had all and, and and Marvel did a similar thing where they tried to bring all these comic books, but you know, it, it never works because over the years you have different writers come in and and Correct. And so suddenly you realize that, oh, we just created a different Wolverine because of because writer B changed something that writer A had had done, you know. Exactly. So the yeah, this is basically to end it all to bring it back to some sort of stasis where it's just one earth. Right. And bringing certain characters to it. It'll be interesting and to see how they way. how they do resolve this with you know, especially at this at this point, and, and we'll get to this when we get to the third part. But you know, all the Earths by the end of part three, all the Earths are destroyed. So obviously, they're going to bring back. They've got to bring back something, um, yes, in order for these shows to even survive. So exactly. it's, it's going to be really interesting to see how they resolve it. Who's going to be the one to to do that? But uh, with that, we should probably get into our discussions of these episodes. Exactly. And the first one would be our thoughts on part one, which would be Supergirl season five, episode nine, and. Uh, I'll throw in a little bit of comic callbacks on this and similarities within the show. Yeah, please. And the similarity to the comic right away is the anti-monitor and the monitor. All that they refer to both of them within the crisis is pretty much the same. He set out to, you know, the anti-monitor set it out to basically destroy all the Earths. But, you know, we have the regular monitor who's gathering our group of super special people and the intro of the actual show is taken directly from the comic the speech he gives when you see just darkness and he's speaking that is from the comics very cool well from first viewing it was clear to me that they want to do what they did in the comic series but crisis on infinite earths was dc's way of breaking up like i said before the multiple worlds in one universe and forcing them to having a lot of the heroes in just one world so it's the same principle and same thought so so i had, had a couple of specific questions just for this episode and uh, it, they kind of are going to reach into the other episodes as well. But so is Earth One, is that like considered like the main TV show Earth that where most of these characters come from? Earth One stemmed from Arrow okay. and the Flash. Okay. So, so those, those, that's the main Earth. That's the first Earth that we know of. The, the Gostin kid. Is that his name? Gostin? Uh, Grant Gustin Grant, and yeah. Stephen Amell. Right. So, so their, so their shows are considered Earth, the Earth One. Right. Correct. Okay. And, and Legends of Tomorrow spawned from that particular Earth. Okay. And so is, is Supergirl, is she, but she's not from that Earth One. She's from a different no. Earth. Yeah. Yeah, okay. and actually, she makes an appearance in a Flash episode, and that was one of the first crossovers where Flash went into her Earth. Okay. okay. And she, he had no clue as to where he was. Right. Uh, it was, yeah, it was him and Cisco that vibed their way there because they needed something from that Earth. So that's okay. how this all started, where they started to be more aware of certain things. And that was in the Flash. That was first yes. established in the Flash. Flash cool. and Supergirl. Okay. The other one that threw me off when it, I had to go, I have to admit to everybody, I went, I had the second viewing, I had to go into IMDb a lot <laughs> to try to keep these characters straight and to know who they were. Because like then there were certain heroes that, like I, I mentioned in our notes, the female in the blue mask who was helping with the evacuation there yes. of Earth, whatever Earth that was they were on. I don't think it, it wasn't Earth One, but uh, the the one that, um, anyway, that, that, uh, they call her Dreamer. Who who is that? Is she a hero from the comic books, or was she invented for the show? She is you... actually in the comic, from what I remember, but they gave her a different name. So it's Nianal, 
and she would be considered a uh, kind of like a meta that was brought out about certain powers throughout a season of Supergirl within the show. And then in the comic book, it was a little bit different. Like she was like an alien or something. Okay. And like uh, in the crisis, com- like in just the DC universe altogether. Correct. And you were right in saying that she is called Dreamer. Right. So, well, I, like I said, I looked it up on IMDb. Yeah, and finally figured out who she was uh, from that. So, very cool. I think I've got some other uh, questions that I'm going to throw out go um, as we as we go through our little moments, kind of that we we both plucked out some moments uh, to share and to talk about. So, why don't we go with yours first? What was your first? Well, first off, for me, with the, the cameos, come on, Alexander Knox from Batman 1989 from Earth. 1989 or 89 that yeah, was amazing that was great that was yeah robert rule um I, I didn't i didn't notice it the first time i watched it It wasn't until the second time i watched it that i realized that that was the guy the reporter yep. from the 89 batman which was so cool to see i i loved how he looks up in the sky and the uh the bat signal is a little bit different yep. than than what it was but it was still uh pretty cool uh to see him i think that was and, licensing uh, issues <laughs> yeah, probably probably um and of course you could go along with the cameos and you've got, I'm sure you've got some more. Oh, definitely. Like I, I knew who Burt Ward, like as soon as I saw Burt Ward, uh, when it said, you know, uh, whatever earth 66 and Burt Ward is walking the dog and he's got that, that sweater on that looks just like his, his Robin costume. I was just like, that's Burt Ward. It's great. And of course, Will Wheaton, what understood out to you? Well, the teen Titans from earth 39 from the actual DC app, which was for the teen Titans show. That's on there. That's a little bit more adult than what's going on on the CW. But the fact that they showed them in a quick instant, it just like, it just like basically validates that they are part of this universe. And DC is uh, willing to do that. And I have to agree. I didn't pick up on that. Yeah. And I have to agree with the Will Wheaton cameo as well as the the end of the world guy. (laughs) Yeah. And that whole thing is that a running gag through Supergirl with that uh, dragon salamander? No. No, no, no. Okay. That's the first time we, so that was just, that was just happening because, because, the crisis was going on exactly on. yeah okay. yeah somebody had something and it just went away but it happened maybe once before and that was about it okay okay because she grabs it and, and like does something to its eye or to its head and then it, it and then it drops back down into the and then when she brings the the dragon back to their little headquarters she's like all the pets in gotham city or blah 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 i didn't catch all of this exactly okay <laughs> uh, well, for me, the, the first thing that jumped out at me is, is it's kind of a negative, but maybe it's a running thing in Supergirl. But the, the Brainiac character, is that is that who he's supposed to be? Yes. Um, he's a good guy mm-hmm. in the TV show, but just the the way his character speaks and, and the things he – like every, every conversation he had <laughs> just took me completely out of it because I was just like, this guy is it, – it's- I don't know. To to clarify, he's Brainiac two thousand. Okay, okay. Or two thousand something. I I forget the actual year. Gotcha. But he's from the future, and he was brought back uh, by Supergirl's last love interest over the past two or three years, okay. and he was lost in space and time. And he meets up, and they call them, uh, I forget the name of the actual group, but they, they kind of changed it for CW. But he's supposed to be a good brainiac. And. Right. I mean, I caught that, that he's a good guy. It just, it just really, I don't know if it was just his character just rubbed me the wrong way. Uh, it rubs a lot of people the wrong way, trust me. Okay. It, okay. He, he's very much camp. He brings like gotcha. the logical aspects of it, but goes a little bit too logical and okay. where it becomes a little bit cynical and they, they just have fun with the character. So, uh, and it just, he was the only, like, that was the only instance that really took me out of it. Yeah. Every, every time he was on screen, every time he was having any kind of conversation with people, I was just like, oh, can we just get to the next thing? Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Like, I didn't even pay – like, I'm sure some of the stuff he said was probably really important to the story, but it just lost me every time. And I was just like, mm, yeah, I'm out with this guy. So, <laughs> so what was another of yours? Uh, another one of mine would be the death of Oliver Queen. Now, I knew that wouldn't be the end of Oliver, Oliver Queen since there are other Green Hours still in the universe, but apparently this particular Ollie is needed to help within the crisis. They pride in just 
you know, between what the monitor states, he's very important. So I think Ollie will die at least another three times within the series <laughs> in some way. I don't know. I, I would love to see the one-armed Oliver Queen we got in the last crossover event that we saw, which was amazing. It was an old man Oliver Queen with the one arm, kind of like the one-armed Hawkeye oh, wow. and, and Logan. But yeah. in this case where he was like able to shoot arrows and everything else. Oh, cool. That's, so, uh, so, so the other crossovers have involved multiverse characters as well. Well, and like, didn't, wasn't Batwoman initially introduced in one of the crossovers? No. From a, Actually, yeah, 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 it was. They did that within one episode of Supergirl. Okay. And they did that, yeah. Okay. Okay. But, uh, that was like a quick one of all yeah. things. So, oh, okay. it was weird. So another one for me is just the, the Alex Danvers character. I, I don't know if she's supposed to be, Kara's sister or some sort of relation. Yeah. I'm assuming she's not Kryptonian because she doesn't have any powers or doesn't appear to have any powers. But she and the female Lex Luthor, which I guess it's not, it's it's a Luthor. It's uh, Lex's relative. sister, adopted sister. Okay. okay. Uh, in this universe. Yes. Earth 38. Or Correct. Whatever. Is that right? Earth 38. Yeah. I, I got that there's definitely a strained relationship there, but I didn't need a lot of the backstory. I really was, I was really impressed with the, the show that they didn't, they didn't do a bunch of extrapolating and a bunch of dialogue to give us the backstory of what's going on with these characters. We just know that they don't like each other. Exactly. I, I, that That's yeah, really what's cool. needed if you're just watching it fresh. Yeah, and they portrayed it really well on screen. You could just see the annoyance they had with, with, with both of them. So I thought that was really cool. Yeah, the way they expressed it was like, oh, you did this in a, from this past time and blah, 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 blah. I don't like you and we don't have yeah. any trust. Kind of like what they did in comics. If you looked at – and they used to have that little callback thing where it's like, see, Supergirl issue number whatever and yeah, follow yeah, that story. That at, the, at the bottom. <laughs> they would tell you, this is where you want to go if you want to find out what's going – what this is all about. But we're not going to explain it to you. Yeah, now. yeah. What was it? Uh, what was it? I forget her. Lena Luthor. And Alex. Alex is Supergirl's or Kara's adopted um, uh, Earth family okay, so sister. The family that, that took her in. Okay. Yeah. See, I don't know a lot of – I know a little bit of the, the Supergirl origin story from the comics, but I don't know a lot. Well, they changed it a little so, bit in the show itself to, to – right. uh, and right. on top of that, she is a representative of the uh, LGBTQ community too as well within that show. So it's it's pretty cool how they are able to bring certain things within those stories that are current today and just incorporate them, which is pretty cool. And I like I really do love the the character Alex. She's very very important to the show. Yeah. So was there anything? What was there? There was another one of yours you had. Yeah, in in the comic, there was a Superboy involved at one point. But the show introducing the firstborn of Superman from Supergirl's universe, or what was it, Earth-38, as being just born. And they had to, uh, you know, they decided to utilize the other Superman from the other universes in general. So, and they just started creating it and taking it from the movies and, and whatnot. I didn't think they would destroy Argo as fast as they did in the first episode. But that was the yeah. only way for that particular Superboy to survive. And I just keep laughing how they, you know, Kryptonians just decide, oh, I'm just going to throw my child out into the world, into the spacecraft. Isn't that, isn't that <laughs> well, it, it did, and it did lead, it, it, it is a cool kind of thing that it, it leads to what my, my last one moment for this show was, is that, that journey to Earth 16 in the year 2046, you know, where they say they tracked the baby to there. And he's like, oh, it must have yeah. gone through a wormhole, but it didn't just travel through space. It traveled through time. time. And so they go there and they meet this older Oliver Queen, mm -hmm. that is is definitely like you can definitely tell. And I loved Stephen Amell played it so great. I thought I thought really really cool. You could tell this is a totally different Arrow mm -hmm. than what we have had anywhere else that we've seen. He's haunted. He's definitely got some uh, some darkness to him, some meanness, and it, it almost part of me when as I watched it for the second time today, I was kind of like, is this a is this an indication that we're gonna get? that some of these Earths are going to come back because how would they be able to go into the future if 
Earth sixteen was destroyed. Exactly. In in you know in the time stream, or how does that work in the time stream? How does mm-hmm. how does the multiverse that that kind of that was a it was a at one point confusing and but it's a really really cool scene that it leads us to with the these uh, and with him encountering uh, his. Uh, is it canary? Is she black canary? White canary? White canary. The, the, the blonde girl. Okay. Yeah. Um. And and she's obviously she's an arrow character. Correct. Um. And and so him encountering her, thinking that because obviously in his in his earth, they she died and he caused her death. Mm-hmm. And in the other earth, he didn't. You know. And we get that moment where they have to explain to him that there's multiverses. And I thought, yeah. that, like again, Stephen Amell just played it really, really cool and, and really great the way he did it about about the understanding that oh, there's multiverses and you you are a, you've survived you know in this other one. And so there's another version of me that is maybe more honorable or more whatever who hasn't had as much loss as as I have. So I thought that was really, really cool. Yeah, and I have to give credit to where credit's due. Stephen ML. Obviously I'm not an Arrow fan. I gave it a shot the first season. I've watched select few episodes, but I I'm not saying it's anything to do with Stephen Amell's portrayal of Arrow. I just did not mm-hmm. like the idea and the story and how it went and where everything was going. Yeah. I, I'm the same way. I, I I just I tried. It was it was too confusing, and there was too much yeah back and forth, and I just couldn't. I I was just like this character is what and who and you know they kept going. They kept flashing back to the island. Yeah, and all these different things that happened for however long he was on that island for. Yeah, and I'm just like this is just it's it was way too confusing. Yeah, I so I, I agree I with you about Arrow early. I enjoy him. He's a great actor. I do believe that, and I think mm-hmm. he portrayed everything very well this is his last season obviously arrow is ending after this so we know what the outcome of crisis is but uh, yeah at least one outcome is going to be but it uh, but he's he's passing the torch on though so correct we'll see if they if they do a uh, another you know maybe a green arrow series yeah call it, with the girl with, with the, the daughter. daughter yeah so that that leads us to part two which was batwoman season one episode nine uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about that episode and the comic callbacks and similarities there? Well, first off, my by far my favorite episode so far in the miniseries. I, I think mine. I think mine too. Yeah, <laughs> there was so much going on with this and the comic callbacks and similarities between the comic and the show. In the comics, it was Batman and Superman as the Paragons, as well as Flash and Green Lantern. But with the CW and what they have to work with within their own universe, they have to rely on Barry. Kara, Kate, and Ollie to do what is needed within the show. Which makes sense, honestly. The issues with Batman and Superman were shown within Kara and Kate at the end when we see Kate with a piece of kryptonite that she got from Bruce on that different alternate Earth. So that, to me, was... that That's not something that really came up within the comics, but the fact that, you know, there was always a Batman within Crisis that always was aiming after Superman or having a contingency <laughs> scenario right, right, that, right. you know, he could get rid of Batman if need be, if he went became a loose cannon. So, yeah, you know, to me, that, that was great callback, and you could see it that that's coming, that Kara and Kate are going to be the Batman and Superman places in this particular show, which yeah. I enjoy. I like the idea. Yeah. So what, Mike, a couple of questions I had for this one is, is what Earth, and I didn't catch the number, what Earth is Batwoman from? Oh, I have that written Did you down. catch the number? It, it wasn't one of the regular numbers that we had, right? It wasn't one of the ones that we've already, already seen. She was from a different earth number yes I don't remember yes what i'm was. forgetting what it is uh yeah I, I thought i had written it down yeah and i think it was in the previous episode when she's on the when she's stopping the wonderland gang or whatever they call themselves uh, yeah her yeah you if you watch that show uh the listeners that are out there if you haven't watched it a lot of people are giving it negative feedback i actually enjoy it i i really liked this episode and i'm uh, i'm encouraged to kind of I may have to use the CW app to, to go back and, and <laughs> they're all and on watch, there. Watch the, the the Batwoman episodes and see what's going on there. Uh, yeah, I thought it was. I it was it was a cool thing that they did throughout these last two parts where they had them like once she took off the cowl with that big 
red wig. No. I don't think she ever put it back on again. Yeah, least, yeah, yeah. You don't see it pretty much you, after you that. Know, in the in the next episode, she's just going cowless, <laughs> which is pretty funny cowless. too. Because the only reason why she did that was on her own Earth, so that she could hide her identity. Right. With right. these people, now, she doesn't have to. Yeah, and that's that's kind of what I picked up on is all of them are kind of they've all kind of decided to take their masks off at, at this point and stuff. And uh, uh, is so there was a lot of comedy in this episode. Is that typical of a Batwoman? No episode. It's, it's it's not. There's usually dark humor, but mm-hmm. not as much as what you see. What you see here is pretty much stems from Supergirl, which has its humorous aspects. Legends mm-hmm. of Tomorrow, which has a lot of humorous aspects. Okay, and Flash. Yeah, we did get a lot. We did get a lot of legends in this. Yeah. Uh, in this second episode here. So, you know, but. Go to- yeah, I, I think they have a decent balance of what's going on as far as the crisis and as far as the humor that's going on in it. Right. Very good. Very good. So let me start with with um, maybe my first kind of moment that was that was really big for me. It was very short. It's just a line that they say at the very beginning of the episode, but they do mention that Oliver's sacrifice saved an extra billion people from that Earth that they were evacuating. Yeah. So I thought that was really really a cool kind of mention to let us know that hey, he didn't just do that for nothing. And but it was a really cool effect there at the end. Of that first episode, I didn't mention it when they're on top of that building or they're, they're on the ground there and the monitor is zapping them all away, you know, in the, in the middle of this fight. And then Arrow's like, no, you're not zapping me away until mm-hmm. and he shoots the monitor with an arrow. So I thought that was really, really cool. My first one would be uh, Captain Cole's voice, Wentworth Miller. As the voice of the Wave Rider <laughs> in a different event dimensions version of the Wave Rider. Instead of Gideon, we get captain cole's voice and i love that yeah and that's really cool i wasn't a prison break i never watched prison break but i think it it had to be really cool for dominic purcell and uh and wentworth miller to to interact again or or, right because those are the two guys on prison break weren't they yeah they were but they actually were in the flash both as captain cold and heat wave oh okay okay so they'd already in the in the in the the shows they'd already kind of interacted. But. They have already interacted. They started off in Flash as the mm-hmm. evil villains, and then uh, yeah, it's a little spoilery, but you actually see them in the Legends of Tomorrow. They're brought into the Wave Rider, yeah. and they become legends. So that's a good way of watching them. And it's it start off with season one. All your yeah. listeners out there, even Steve too, because I I found it humorous and loved the idea of both characters. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that leads right into my second kind of moment, which was that trip to Earth 74 where they get, you know, they have this whole back and forth where she's like, she's like, oh, we're going to get a wave rider. And they're like, well, we told our crew <laughs> of our wave rider that they don't have to do a crossover again. And so they're <laughs> like, well, we don't have to use your wave rider. We'll go get one that doesn't have a crew yeah. on it. And then, of course, they get there and there's this guy wandering around inside uh, in in the thing and they're, they're convincing him to come. And uh, I, I love that they that she mentions that. The, well, I thought the legends of Earth seventy four had retired, and he he's like, well, yeah, but now I've I've got this whole ship to myself, and the and he's got the back and forth with the with the ship. He's like, you're basically living in your car, and then like <laughs> she's convincing him to come along. He's like, look, you had me at beer, so <laughs> I just I really I really enjoyed that uh, that interaction, and then that character throughout the the uh, the episode is is really really cool. Rory is the most humorous thing in that show. There was a couple of times where he came very dark, but mm-hmm. Heat Wave, if you watch that, he, you know, him writing that book, <laughs> that, yeah. yeah, that was something that happened before. And we've seen alternate versions of him, which is pretty funny, but I have that interaction with uh, him and Wentworth Miller as uh, the voice of the Wave Rider. That, that was, yeah. that was fun. Very, very cool. My next one would be the the Paragons in the show are different from the comic in the show. They Oh, are they? Okay. Yeah, they change due to the characters they have. Basically, what like I said before, which was amazing when they thought that the Bat of the Future was Batman Earth-99, which was basically Kingdom Come Batman, which was played by Kevin Conroy, who actually voiced the Batman in the 90s. Hmm. So for Batman the animated series for those of you who never watched it I highly recommend it I have the whole set. Is that the one where uh is it Mark Hamill does the voice for the Joker? Correct. In that one okay. Yeah. Yeah, but the the moment that we find out that it wasn't him at all and the books that the monitor you know 
it, it was wrong, apparently. Plus, seeing a- well, but he he explains that though, because they all thought, oh well, the monitor. I doubted the monitor, but he even he comes out and the monitor says, I didn't say that he was the paragon. Exactly, I said he will lead you to to the paragon, the paragon yeah. the bridge. And so, uh, I, so I picked up on that, especially the second time watching it. But for me, and this is, plays right into I have the same really the same moment sure. is just these seven these seven paragons mm-hmm. uh, that we have that we we find out right away that supergirl and canary are two of them and for me the first time i watched the series this episode as soon as he said the future bat is the paragon of courage i was like well she's standing right there obviously <laughs> she's the one. like i don't know why you guys are even going anywhere because obviously she's the one yeah you know yeah so it, w- it was due to licensing they never really had a batman they have had a superman obviously we had tyler mm-hmm. he- hecklin or hoakland on on the supergirl show but we've never had a true batman gotham has gone off the air they never brought that kid in to actually be as a Batman, and we've only seen him in shadows or just stories. So they brought in, you know, Kevin Conroy to play this futuristic style of Batman who's corrupt and, you know, just yeah, just to good. see him dark and, and broken and corrupt – Seeing that collection he has of his conquest of foes. Oh, and that was just heartbreaking when Kara sees the the glasses. Yeah. And she knows, just from that quick glimpse of those glasses, she knows that he's he killed this Earth's Superman. Yeah. You know, and uh, that was just crazy, and that was really... Yeah. And then on top of that, he rattles off. You actually do see Riddler's cane that's broken. A snow globe of snow from Mr. Freeze. Two faces coin. Yeah. Uh, then uh, you you see Bruce stating that you know Clayface is just a puddle of mud, and yeah, then you see his you know Kate, yeah his Kate was dead. His Kate, um, whatever her Kate Kane in his Earth is dead, and he's like, so you're not Clayface because I've killed Clayface, and you're not this person because this person is dead. Yeah. So you must be like it was really kind of cool to see the way he rationalized the her presence there and the the existence of these multiverses because he goes obviously you must be from another an alternate earth because and here's all these reasons so you could really see the intelligence behind that so i thought that was a really really cool scene yeah definitely yeah there's so many callbacks within that and just to see kevin conroy honestly you know i've been a fan since like the 90s i watched that show when it came on oh wow in the afternoons and stuff and then I got the whole Blu-ray set, and I got the digital download, and they have all the nice. movies and everything. Yeah, I recommend it to anybody who, if you've never watched the Batman the animated series, go watch it because there's like so many key cool episodes. So that's all I recommend. <laughs> and this this leads to to kind of my my only my next criticism of this this crossover series or this this little mini series of uh, of episodes is Ray Palmer's ability to create a paragon detector and I'm <laughs> putting air quotes on that because I'm just like that was really that just seemed like a a very clunky <laughs> kind of kind of story point that they they should have found some way around like either either have them find some prophecy books or something or just any other way but that just that just seemed like a very clunky yeah. kind of story device for them to to use that he's gonna he that the monitor is just gonna give him a few facts about these paragons and now i can search the entire multiverse for these you know three other people that we don't know it just it it just i was just like "Ah, well there's a little history behind that because ray has always been seen as the crazy scientist that does all these weird Mm -hmm. things he actually fixed firestorm firestorm you know where uh the two characters that created firestorm uh one had died he had to find somebody else and they found somebody and he made it work with right. a different person who's able to make <laughs> other tech work he's been doing this on the wave rider for so long over his time travel quote unquote time travel time within legends yeah. of tomorrow so what was it uh, it was in the first episode he makes that mention where he he kind of tells batwoman he could make a suit uh he could make her suit <laughs> yeah. and she's like if you want to keep that arm you'd 
They're, Not touch know. me because uh, I got it. He's like, yeah, okay, fine. You know, your suit's great. Your suit's great the way it is. You know? And then he fixes just, her batarang. Yeah, he does. He does fix her batarang there at the end of the the, the episode. That was really really cool. Uh, my little bit would be uh, the next part would be seeing the death of Superman by Clark and Lois on another Earth with Lois grieving over that particular Superman of that world. It's reminiscent of the death of Superman on you know if you, look, you ever got that comic. According mm-hmm. to theories, uh, it was the Superman that was from the Superboy of the '90s series because there was a. Mm. TV series in the 90s that was Superboy and I actually met that guy. He's a very nice guy. I couldn't really see if it was the same actor, but it was a different symbol of Superman and it had the the flag with the Superman emblem on it and everything, but I don't know if uh, it was that particular one, but I knew it was definite callback for that. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, that was, that was a cool little, in the background, you could see that on the TV there. Yeah. For me, my, my next one is uh, the character of Constantine. You know, I never watched that show, but I, I do love that that kind of character, the idea of that character, and uh, this betrayal of this this guy, the way he portrayed it, uh, was really really good. And I, I like the other, just kind of a side note, is just all of you got Constantine, you've got Lucifer, and um, <laughs> these other other characters in in the next episode. I think we both mentioned the birds of prey. Mm-hmm. We, these, these characters, these actors and actresses that are able to come back yeah. uh, and re and reprise these roles from their shows that have been canceled. I, I think was just so cool for them to, to, to bring them back even for this just short little, little bit. I thought was really, really cool. Yeah. It was a definite callback for older and even older too because if you look at it we'll 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 get into later about christopher reeve and all that stuff Mm -hmm. but the fact that we get all stuff it it just like it tugs at your heartstrings of anybody who's watched these movies these shows love the shows when they came out even if they were there for like one season and or maybe one season and they had great actors and they just it just disappeared because of ratings yeah for whatever reason ratings yeah whatever, and whatever and on top of that a movie that would just came and passed and nobody acknowledged yeah. though i loved it but yeah i, I like the the keanu reeves uh version was really really good Keanu uh, Reeves? Yeah, the Constantine. He played Constantine. Oh, yes. But this Constantine that we get was actually from... Is a different... It was right? actually a from... A, yeah, but that's from a series that was canceled. Right. No, that's yeah. what I'm saying. The, the, this, this guy playing with the blonde hair, that's more true to the comic book Constantine. Yes. Even, but, but when Keanu Reeves played it, I guess he didn't want to dye his hair or whatever. <laughs> but uh, but I like that movie as well. And I like... I, I, like I said, I want to kind of... If I can find this the this original show that had this other guy on it... it oh, it's out there. Like, <laughs> interesting interesting show uh, to check out but yeah so it just that that opportunity for these guys to come back and repri- kind of reprise those roles was really, yeah. really really cool and i think you and i both have the same thing where we're seeing tom welling as clark kent from smallville oh, so amazing <laughs> go ahead and, and, and say your piece about it because i'll, I'll well just seeing him that. as clark kent and erica durant's from their world apparently we, oh. he gave up his powers to have children with lois but still can just beat up lex without powers so he goes yeah i still got it <laughs> by the way i love that i'm still stronger that whole, that <laughs> quote of, i'm still stronger <laughs> i love how he he like like you you hear erica durant's voice and you know and i'm absolutely in love with erica durant's if you're listening erica durant's you have a fan. She's not listening to our, <laughs> <laughs> but he turns around and he's talking to her off screen and, and, uh, John Cryer goes to punch him and he turns around and catches the fist in, and he and, knocks him out. <laughs> I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I, I love that whole interaction between him and John Cryer, especially he's like, you're not Lex. You know? <laughs> and, and he's like, well, I'm not your Lex, you yeah. know? <laughs> and, or the comment that he makes when the when the the other characters are there, which I, that's another thing that I thought was kind of interesting was that guy. So that's that's the Lois and and Clark uh, Superman from Supergirl, right? Um, uh, uh, Tyler Hecklin and, and yeah, 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 yeah. And 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 he actually calls her Lois, and right before they dis- right before uh, John Cryer's Lex Luthor zaps them away you hear him call her Lois but Tom Welling's uh, Clark doesn't really acknowledge it doesn't really acknowledge yeah. it yeah 
But I, I thought that was kind of a, a cool little little uh, thought there to where – and what was it? Uh, uh, she makes the comment that he came off the brawny paper towel. Yeah, he's the brawny man. <laughs> you know, because you know, he's like, I could do that with just with one swing or you – know. Mind you, Tyler H- Hecklin, if you look at him, he's very short and not as big. And he's not very buff. And, and Tom <laughs> Welling, honestly, if uh, – the I, I forget who it was. Somebody from the YouTubes. It, it could have been like uh, John Camp. Yeah, and he, he, I think he stated it's like Tom Welling was the biggest of all the people who played Superman apparently within this series. He's taller and bigger than Brandon Ralph. Looks like he's maintained. He definitely looks like he's maintained that kind of. Physique, oh yeah, you know where. Whereas, and like Brandon Ralph, so I'm assuming they did some sort of padding or something. A little bit, yeah, because you saw a difference between him as Ray Palmer and him as yeah. yeah. Yeah, they, you, and I think, and Tom Welling's been keeping himself in shape. He was actually on Lucifer at one point. Well, I'm sure, yeah. Yes, yeah, he played a little part oh, in Lucifer he? at one point. Cool. So he came over and played with the the toys over there for a while. He didn't really want to do it, and then somebody talked him into it. Yeah. But the cool thing was is that he got his no tights, no flights rule in this version as well. <laughs> but, you, you know, when they when they panned over, and I didn't notice it again the first time I watched it, the second time I watched it, it, when they panned over those newspapers on the yeah. wall – of his home they show pictures of him flying yeah. pictures of him you know obviously you can't see his face but uh so i thought that was a really really cool kind of thing just to throw into those newspaper headlines there especially when and i thought when 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 lex is when you hear something crunch and lex looks down on his foot i would <laughs> like patty or something like that but then he's got you know it's the little truck and and he's like really that's what you gave up your powers for was to have a family and it's just yeah. so poignant and so great and then him and him and uh, erica durant's walking away just kind of arm in arm she's yep. laughing and she still called him smallville i just I, I that whole i hope part of me hopes we get to see this world come back this earth whatever uh um, uh, Earth 167. Um, I wrote it actually in my notes. Earth 167, Smallville. Uh, I hope we kind of get to see that come back. But if we don't, that's okay too, because that just that vision of them walking away, kind of arm in arm, yeah. to go see the kids. I thought was just uh, it just it touched touched my heart. Yeah, and oddly enough, uh, of all things, Tom Welling signed on for this. Michael Rosenbaum declined, and uh, I listened to Michael Rosenbaum's huh. uh, podcast, and he stated that. It's like, yeah, I declined. He didn't like what they were trying to write for him for it. It was going to be kind of a a cameo, very similar to what Tom Welling had. But mm-hmm. I think he was just like, yeah, you know what? I'll give it to John Cryer. Just leave it in John Cryer's hands. Yeah, I don't know how they would have. It's it, that's interesting you say that because I wonder how they would have would have had him. In the, the, they would have had to wrote a whole separate thing, maybe, maybe show him on the TV or something, or, you know, just he's, he's or having, interact having with the other Lex Luthor. Who knows? With, right. That's what I'm saying is, is like, like, like if he just happened to be randomly that day yeah. visiting. Yeah. Like, and they're friends now <laughs> you know, in Smallville. And it happens to be, it happens to be actually the same day as this, this occurs. You know, it would have been a weird, weird way, but that's, yeah. Uh, so I'm okay with that, though. Yeah, to me, that, 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 that made a lot to just, me. Uh, the last bit I would have for this episode would be seeing Kingdom Come Superman as played by Brandon Routh. He's in the same series, and they do a callback as Christopher Reeves, because they use the music, the John Williams music. Absolutely, yeah. The next episode, the next episode, for yeah. sure, the, the next episode and, is really you know, great, really and. Well. Uh, yeah, it's just basically another version of Kingdom Come Superman's based on the suit he wears because you see the dark within the S. It's amazing, and I love oh, seeing okay. Brandon back okay. as Superman. Yeah. I, I actually enjoyed Superman Returns. A lot of people didn't, but I did. So yeah, I had this as my same my same kind of next point was just the, the whole the running joke, and it, it kind of goes into 
the the next one a little bit, but they the, the whole running joke of when Kara yeah. when Kara sees him for the first time working out, she's like, "Great, you've been, you've been working out." And she kind of she kind of gives him a she kind of gives him the once over, and uh, and t- the Tyler Hecklin is like, "Hey, hey he's, he's basically your cousin." Okay, you can't you know he's he's in that universe he's your cousin. Yeah. You, can't, you, you can't don't be messing with that. You know. So I thought that was that was really the whole the whole interaction they had was with it, and I didn't realize that the Superman Returns movie was an yes. extension of the Christopher Reeve character universe. I didn't I didn't realize that. So that that makes me kind of want to watch Superman Returns. I I mean I know it didn't get really Yeah, good it it reviews. didn't, but I enjoyed it because I I think the way Brandon Routh looks, mm-hmm. he looks just like Christopher Reeves. Mm-hmm. And I think I forgot who did it. Uh he did the X-Men. Brian uh, Singer. Brian Singer did that yeah. and I thought he did it very well. It just didn't it wasn't received very well for its time because it had been so long since we had a Superman movie. Yeah. And I I think a lot it kind of lost its weight at that time. Yeah. Going back and watching it, you can appreciate it for the little things, but to me I enjoyed it and I I loved all the actors and actresses in it. You know, they they did a great job and I love Brandon Routh in it. That was yeah. the one thing I remember from that. And to continue on with that thought, you know, as far as like just seeing Brandon as that, the call back to the comics when the Joker killed people in Metropolis with the gas at the Daily Planet. And that was something that they referenced to with that poster where you saw all the people's names on it. Right. That was well, from yeah, a no, comic all book. Plaques. Yeah, all the plaques on the wall there. And yeah. You know, we get to see that this paragon of truth is is a broken man he's a a broken superman who's yeah who's lost everything and uh so yeah that was a that was a really really good scene and something i would like to recommend to everybody if you are reading your comics and you have not read it kingdom come is a very good trade paperback i recommend it highly <laughs> it, it kind of stems from the idea of people who are treating our heroes as almost almost like gods same thing with Superman within uh, Metropolis, whereas Batman was in Gotham, and then with Wonder Woman and wherever she was, as well as the Flash. And it, it's it's an interesting read. Yeah. But that's where they got this particular Superman from. But cool. the best part of this episode to me was we get the battle of the Supermans in yeah. this episode. You know, Brandon and Tyler just hit it, and a lot of what they're saying online is that the idea for this, uh, that whole battle scene is literally how they're going to treat the next show that's coming on CW, which will be about Superman and Superboy. Hmm. And they did callbacks for Superman three too within this, yeah, the whole choking it's scene. The first time. And it's not the first time I've, I've fought with myself. I thought that was really, really great. Yeah. 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 Uh, the only last thing I had for this episode is just the the. It's not really introduction because he's been on Legends before, but Jonah Hex. But seeing oh, yeah. Jonah Hex portrayed, I I did not realize that's who it was, and I kind of had to look at it again uh, today when I was rewatching the episode. I was like, that's Jonah Hex. And then of course she gives him <laughs> the scar. She she got the knife, and she's like, well, you got to get this scar some way. Somehow <laughs> that was really really cool. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was a I was a huge Jonah Hex in before they made it all supernatural. Yeah, the original just old west comic book of Jonah Hex I thought was really really great. So uh, we're gonna talk about our thoughts on part three, which would be the Flash season six episode nine. So I'll start off with the comic callbacks and similarities on this, and the callback from issue number seven of the comics cover. Instead of Superman holding a dead Supergirl, we get a Supergirl holding Kingdom Come Superman before Luthor takes the place of Brandon Routh's Superman. And That's I a thought crazy that, moment. Is that, that was so, crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's like in, in the actual comic book, Supergirl dies. Oh, in, she's the, pretty, in the Crisis comic? Yeah, in the okay. Crisis comic. Because she was uh, attacking the uh, the anti-monitor. Mm-hmm. And in, in this case, it's just something that suddenly, but they had to do a visual callback to that particular moment. So and, and you could see her holding him just almost similarly in the way that uh, Superman was holding Supergirl. So I thought that was a pretty cool visual. Yeah. The only other one I have would be the Monitor bringing all the heroes that will fight as Paragons to the Wave Rider. In a comic, it was a space station with no name that the Monitor had set up instead of 15 heroes 
we get seven paragons. Yeah, and then and then Pariah sends them uh, to the vanishing point. So yes. The yeah, end, so. it's another switcheroo that we get. So, yeah, there's a lot of callbacks to the comics. It's not exact because, like I stated, you know, the, it's, yeah. it, it's not going to be perfect because, you know, CW is doing what they can with the licensing and what they can. But they're doing very well from what I could see. The only question I had from this sp specific episode is the girl with the black lipstick, the IMDb called her Killer Frost. Yes. Um, who is that character? Is that a is that a comic character? Is that somebody that the show's created or Killer Frost is an actual comic book character and she was evil. She was a uh, a nemesis of the Flash. Okay. But in this case for the show, they were creating metas in Central City based upon the explosion that created Barry's powers. So okay. metas were coming up. Now, mind you, Caitlin Snow worked within Central City at Star Labs with Barry and Harrison Wells and Cisco Ramon. And they didn't think anything happened. But later on, within the Flash seasons, you see this was an underlining thing. There was always something there. There was always another personality within her. And that personality came out, and it was something that came from her own father's uh, experimentation. And he was actually kind of like a frosty kind of guy. Okay. So, but uh, yeah, uh, Danielle Panabaker became Killer Frost, and then they kind of reverted her and are changing Frost over the past season and a half to a super person, like a, a hero. Okay. And and that's her alter ego, but they are two different people within one. So she's able to oh. switch from okay. Caitlyn to Killer. Hmm. So that's why you got that whole ending scene where, uh, you know, she just changes and she's got red hair and she just looks like Daniel Panabaker and then next thing you know, she's Killer Frost. Right, okay, so she actually transforms herself. Correct. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Yeah. She was, she was the only character that kind of threw me off as to, I, I didn't know who that was or what her connection was. A great character too, by the way. Is it? Okay. And she's on the flash. Yes. Okay. So I'll start off my first one. I think we, we've got similar ones points in here as well, but uh, it's just, I loved, I, I loved the birds of prey TV show when it was on whatever it was 15, 16 years ago. I never saw it. And I only remember seeing like maybe two episodes. I watched it. It was, a, it was, a, it, it went through, I think it was one season. I checked it on IMDb. It, it was 2002, 2003. It was, I liked it. I enjoyed it. It was really good. It had, um, some, some female characters that I really liked. And it, it was just basically, you know, what you saw there is that you had, uh, a, a woman kind of, uh, and we only got her voice in the, in this episode, we only heard her voice, but she was like the crow's nest or whatever they call her. And then you had uh, the the girl at the beginning. I just it was really really cool. Huntress. Just, yeah, Huntress. yeah, we, Huntress. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we see Huntress, mm -hmm. and she's on a mission, and yeah. she's seeing all the thing that's coming on from the quantum energy that's going on that's dissolving yeah. the Earth. Exactly. And she's on the com link with uh, the Oracle, which is Dina Meyer. Right, the Oracle. Who, right, that's I couldn't remember what she was called. Who is actually Barbara Gordon? Who was yes. Batgirl? Yes, and that was in that was all in the Birds of Prey thing where she got injured and and became the Oracle, and so and that was Earth two hundred three. Yes, so. my point would be seeing John Wesley Ship as the Flash on the treadmill to power the quantum machine that uh, the Anti Monitor had, then take the place of Barry Allen's. Flash that dies in Flashpoint or this whole crisis and thus giving us another season of the Flash and I think yay that's awesome you know that John Wesley Shipp did that and on top of that you know we get to see the flashback of him from 1990 that was so that, cool and yeah. that was Earth 90 and we we get a visual of him and Amanda Pays in mm -hmm. who is a love interest as well as the scientist within that show. Yeah. And yeah. we we get that and I I have that season somewhere on a hard drive. I, I have it somewhere and I've watched it a couple of times. You also get to see Mark Hamill as the trickster in that show and he yeah. reprises his 
role as the trickster in The Flash. So if you guys have not oh, watched cool. The Flash, go watch it. There's a lot of things that are cool in The Flash. So uh, the fact that John Wesley Shipp plays Barry Allen in that 90s universe comes back. Not only did he play Barry Allen's father in this particular series on the CW, but also Jay Garrick in this particular series of The Flash as well. So he's played multiple versions of Barry's father that looks just like his father as either Flash, Jay Garrick, anything. Yeah. And he, he has multiple conversations. To me, bringing John Wesley Ship on to that show is amazing. Yeah, I thought it was really cool. And I th really thought they addressed it really well when, when Barry's talking about it. And he says that the Earth-90 Flash resembles his father who was in prison, was framed for killing his mother. And I, so I really liked that conversation because it cleared up some questions that I started to have during the episode of going, huh, wait a minute, does he? Because <laughs> I, I looked it up again, I looked it up on IMDb and I saw that John Wesley Shipp had, was in a bunch of episodes in the early seasons of The Flash. Well, throughout all the seasons, but really in season one, especially. Yeah. And I was like, I wonder if they address that. And then, of course, there at the end of the episode, they do address that. Yeah, he looked, he resembles my father from this earth, uh, which was, was really cool. It was really cool for them to acknowledge that. And I, I really loved how they, how they played with that kind of stuff in these episodes with the whole Brandon Routh thing. And they didn't mention that, you know, Erica Durance plays Kara's mother. Yeah. In Supergirl. And yep. they didn't mention because Supergirl wasn't with them when they went to visit the Tom Welling Earth where Erica Durance was playing Lois Lane. So, but that, that would have been kind of interesting if Supergirl had gone to that, to that Earth and saw Erica Durance's character there and was, and it's like, hmm, that's Tom, what are you so, doing yeah, here? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That would have been an interesting uh, interaction. Yeah. But we saw her in the very beginning die on Argo. Yeah. On Argo. And City. yeah. So, yeah, so it'll be interesting. Again, that's one of those things that I wonder if we're what they're going to do as far as bringing these worlds back. There's been, you know, there's there are comments peppered throughout, especially this last episode. They talked a lot about the Book of Destiny and, you know, yeah. when Kara grabs the book and, and then Batwoman has to convince her not to do it because she's going to try to bring all the open the book up and bring all these worlds back. But John Cryer had explained to them, you're going to have to be like what I like. He explained that like what I did took an enormous amount of concentration and I was just doing a little thing. You know, yeah. I was just hopping from world to world and killing these supermen. But mm -hmm. yet you're trying to actually bring a world, a whole universe back, not just a planet back. You're trying to bring a whole universe back and you're not going to be able to contain that kind of energy or do that kind of a, of an action. So I thought that was, that was a really cool. And I'm sure we're going to see probably the, the way this whole thing is going to wrap up is one of these characters. Someone is going to sacrifice themselves. Oh yeah. Bring the multiverse back using that book of destiny. So it's going to be interesting to see how they, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it's a fight between Kate and Kara. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that how that plays out. So I kind of listed out the Paragons that we've got. Uh, of course, we've got the Paragon of Hope, which is our, our Supergirl. The mm -hmm. Paragon of Truth, which is the Brandon Routh Superman. And then the, the Paragon of Courage, which is Batwoman. The Paragon of Destiny, which is Canary. The Paragon. Now, was it Martian Manhunter? Was he the, yes. the pitcher? Okay. That's John. Cause, Cause yeah, that's John Jones, right? Yeah. I knew who that, that was, but when they showed his picture as the Paragon of Honor, it almost looked like the monitor for a minute there because one of the characters is like, of course, um, <laughs> yeah, but it's then, John. Yeah. But it's, it's John Jones. Okay. Uh, then we've got the Paragon of Love, which is the Flash, which I thought was kind of a cool. And yeah. of course, the Paragon of Humanity, which is our Dr. Choi played by Osric Chow from Supernatural. As soon as I saw his picture come up on the screen, I was like, that's Osric Chow from Supernatural. <laughs> that was so cool. Uh, I, I absolutely love that actor. He doesn't do, uh, he hasn't done enough stuff. He's, he's, he's very, very cool as Kevin Tran in Supernatural. Uh, Current character there and uh, so it, but of course the ending with lex i'm assuming what what he did there when he said he rewrote the book is mm -hmm. that he wrote himself in as the paragon of truth correct instead of the brandon routh story. which is very odd <laughs> yeah. yeah it seems a little bit like 
Okay, I mean, is that is there anything even remotely like that in the comic book? No, the actually Lex Luthor does help towards the end, but the thing is, is during this whole time of crisis, a lot of the villains of all these characters in various multiple universes are trying to do more worse than anything, mm-hmm. and Lex actually gets himself involved with Brainiac. And they're out there, but Brainiac winds up hijacking him. Another Brainiac hijacks him to do something good to help out, of all things. So, I think this was their way of like, well, we can't do the real Brainiac. We already have Brainiac 2000 whatever. So, we're just going to do this. So, that way, we incorporate Lex and he does something, but he's still Lex. Yeah. (laughs) So, what was another one of yours? Another one of mine... Uh, you probably don't understand the character, but when Ralph Dibney comes on the Wave Rider, he makes the announcement of who he is, and he is prepared. But Killer Frost states, "Don't mind, don't mind him. It's his first crossover." Yeah. Now, <laughs> so what is that? Who is that character? Is Ralph. He- all right, uh, we already talked about how DC couldn't license certain things to CW. Mm-hmm. So, do you remember Plastic Man? I was wondering. So that was the guy, the elongated man who, who correct his arm out. Who they, how they <laughs> proved to Brandon Ralph that they're actually superheroes is that that's that's uh, that's that who that guy is. is correct. He in, is he is he in one of the, the other? He's shows? in the Flash. He's in the Flash. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. So, Ralph Dimney is pretty much your uh, comedic sidekick at this point. He's training to be a hero. And he was the – at one point, he was a private detective, but he was a police officer that had to leave the force because he was doing things wrong and illegal. And he became a private uh, detective, and they found out he was a meta. Mm -hmm. And then they decided to help him out, and even though they all worked together – it was Barry and his father-in-law, uh, yeah. Joe West, and they and they all know, and they're like, okay, well, uh, you're going to learn how to use your powers, so we're going to yeah. help you out, and blah, blah, blah. So now he's become officially, within the past season, like they said, here is your your superhero yeah. badge it on just, you. It, it just says like EA. Kind of a character just yeah. got thrown in there at the last minute. Go, oh, we got to get another character in here. So yeah, it, they, they're working what they got. And mm-hmm. honestly, I, I actually love the, the actor and the character. So yeah, very cool. Anything else? Or? Um, well, to go back to that, that whole scene there with the earth 90 flash and mm-hmm. where he, he says he's taking some of, Barry's speed from him is that a is that a thing that they've done in the show before that this trans- no I power? I've not I think they might have done it with the reverse flash okay and they had a uh, another dark character called Savitar or something like that I, I didn't I didn't catch it uh, either time when I watched it but he says something about you learn a little something about this when you're something and then he yes. Yeah. He yeah, he's got to learn. That's another something he has to learn yeah, from. So he 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 learned how to do that, and then he gets on the treadmill. And his sacrifice is what stops the wave from from hitting Earth One. Uh, but then, of course, we do see there at the end when Harbinger comes in that they end up losing Earth One anyway. Yeah, and Pariah zaps all of them to the vanishing point, and that's where that that ending is, where we see Lex transform. Uh, where we see Brandon Routh, Superman, transform into Lex, and he stands yeah. up, and he's just like, I can't believe that worked, you know. <laughs> and, um, so you know, so we're left with these seven characters at mm-hmm. the end of the of the episode, and uh, it's it's going to be interesting to see when we pick up here uh, in a week or so. January fourteenth, I think, is yeah. when Arrow comes back, and then uh, part five, I believe, is Legends. So. Yeah, and for all you listeners out there, obviously we're on the Next Level Podcast Network, so what you might want to do is actually listen to DC Primetime and listen to their episodes based upon it. Uh, Steve and I are just... uh yeah, giving our yeah, thoughts and reviews. T- yeah, we're just barely touching on this. DC Primetime really dug deep into these three episodes, and of course, they're gonna uh, they're gonna wrap up. Ben and Ben has already announced that they're gonna wrap up their podcast with this crisis crossover. So, and that yeah, you know, with the last two that we'll review of this, we'll talk to Ben and see if he'll actually come on. Because yeah, we'll I'm pretty sure. 
about it by then. <laughs> we'll see, uh, well, you never we'll know. We'll try. Yeah. The only other thing I had was the, like you mentioned in the last episode, but I really picked up on it in this episode when Brandon Routh's Superman lands in, or when he lands in the ship, that OG Superman score from the Christopher Reeve movie was, was really cool to see in, in, in here. So. Well, it's not only just that. We, when we saw, um, what was it? Uh, Batman eighty nine or yeah, Earth eighty nine? The they they played the the Batman music as well. I didn't pick up like I, said, I really picked up on it in this episode when when uh, I really yeah. could hear it for sure. Yeah, so. so they're 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 pulling a lot of callbacks from this, and they I, you know they paid a lot. Yeah, and to me, uh, just hearing that because I saw that movie with Michael Keaton in the theater and. You know, mm-hmm. hearing that me uh, right away, you just know. And same yeah. thing with Superman. I saw that in, a, in the theater as a kid too. Mm-hmm. So it, it just gives all the feels that you need to. Very much exactly. like Star Wars. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Love it. So, did you have anything else? The only thing that I have left would be, uh, though I'm not a, a fan of Black Lightning, and and I haven't caught up. I I try to get into the show, and I kind of lost track. Mm-hmm. But I do appreciate the character and him showing up. Put pretty much a huge smile and helping out what was going on with that quantum machine with uh, the flash from 90. And, and I thought right away that he would be a great contribution to the crossover because I don't think the, the black lightning show might be re up for another season or so. Yeah. I'm not I, sure. They, they might just incorporate his character into the other shows. If they merge everything into earth one, yeah, which and would be interesting. And that's going to be the thing coming in because he's, you know, he's, uh, and that that's that's why I'm a little, I'm a little. It's it's going to be it real interesting to see how they start this next episode because really all we have left is these seven people at yeah. the vanishing point, and because everybody else who was on the wave rider got caught in the quantum wave, correct, and and so we don't even know where the monitor is. The monitor seemed to get caught in that when he was in that fight with Harbinger. Mm-hmm. You know, he seemed to disintegrate or something, and that's when Pariah zapped him all away. And so, you know, where is this? How is this next episode even going to start? Is it going to pick up right where we? I'm assuming it's going to have to start right where we left where off. Left off, yeah. And and how are they going to fight? I'm interested to see what they're going to do because they've obviously and obviously you've got you still have Oliver Queen who is now taken on, uh, you know, whatever the Spectre is, but he's in. Hell, not hell, uh, purgatory. Yeah, he's in purgatory. So th- does purgatory still exist? Is is he going to have a part to play in the next episode? I would think for the fact that, you know, maybe that didn't get vanished out. Right. That's the thing. What what did we, what all did we lose in this last wave of quantum energy that took out Earth-1 and took out the Wave Rider? Yeah. Did we lose Earth 666 where Lucifer yeah, was? I, I don't know. I mean, that's yeah. the thing. We don't know. I mean, assuming we had to have because they said that Earth 1 was the last one, that everything else has been had been – was gone. They, they made that statement in the show that Earth 1 was the last one. And so when they stopped the wave, Earth 1 was the only Earth that existed. And then, of course, just – then Harbinger – pops in and pariah pops in and that's when we get the whole interaction about where pariah where they're like wait the harbinger where have you been you've been missing and she's like i don't know i don't remember where i've been and then yeah. then then they realize that wait a minute, why is pariah here pariah is only the anti-monitor only shows only puts pariah where he can witness a great tragedy uh, or something tragedy yeah tragedy happened and so suddenly that's when they figure out that harbinger has been taken over by the anti-monitor and she attacks john jones and she attacks everybody else you Mm -hmm. know and they have this big fight and then and then leads us to you know him pariah sending them to the vanishing point so yeah these are just thoughts of mine maybe mm -hmm. time becomes a a thing where we get another wave rider from a future from a the distant future, maybe that yeah. Oliver Queen that we saw becomes somebody oh, to yeah, help, maybe, and maybe. maybe Rory or somebody from a different legends from an alternate timeline comes mm-hmm. in to help. Who knows? Yeah, it's definitely uh, it's definitely going to be interesting to see what they do 
I'm excited for it. I'm excited for it too. Yeah, I, I gotta make sure uh, I set my new my DVR. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, the way I watched the uh, the episodes a few times, and I I actually did it for my coworker too because he's interested. He loves DC. He's mm-hmm. I think he watched Joker like 15 times already. <laughs> but uh, he uh, I good. I don't know if it was that good. I, but okay. I, I uh, <laughs> he loves it. So I I pieced all these together as like one whole movie, and Steve and I both watched them that way and it makes it so much easier to watch with no commercials and just be able to you know edit yourself and just do that yeah it was really good thank you for that no problem man it, it's 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 a way i did the last uh crossover i have that somewhere i have to send that to you because that's a funny one that's interesting yeah that's a different world so uh we'll move on to comic talk sure and some things you want to discuss yeah, definitely. Uh, we have confirmation that we will be getting the new Mutants movie, finally. So they, they finally decided to release it. And thank goodness. Uh, I, I've been wanting to see this movie for years. Once I saw the first promo, I don't know how many years ago. Yeah, and they completed production on it, right? Is that is that what happened? And they're, they're, They were supposed to go back for reshoots, but they never did. Gotcha. And... Uh, I forget her name, who played in Game of Thrones. She, Maisie, uh, Maisie Williams. Maisie, I'm, looking at, I'm looking at the cast list right now. And I yeah, Maisie that. Williams. Uh, yeah, she stated in a interview about like four or five months ago, stating, I was never asked to come back. We never really finished or did any reshoots or anything. So I don't know what's happening with this movie. Right. So now that Disney is doing everything what they can with their Disney Plus, they're, they're, factoring in i think this has to do with the fact that dark phoenix didn't do well in the theaters oh wow so they're they're trying to catch up and uh they allowed the director to do his original cut of the Mm -hmm. movie which was pretty much like almost a horror kind of movie but within the uh x-men style universe with mutants with these new mutants as per yeah according to what i'm seeing here on imdb it was originally supposed to release in 2018 yeah so so they they had finished principal photography or you know principal filming by what 2017 then probably so you're talking if, if you try to do reshoots now it's gonna be interesting to see those those actors yeah they're not doing them they're yeah. they're actually gonna release it as the cut that he originally went with yeah, when he years, finished from the film ago, from so three, three years ago so that's gonna be interesting to see uh, yeah what they look like so yeah, I I I'm really interested because yeah. the the story on this is uh, uh I forget that it was like a nightmare bear thing and it was a very interesting uh concept within the comics. So I'm really wanting I've been wanting to see this cuz it's a different take. It's com- almost like what they were looking to do with Doctor Strange mm-hmm. as being like almost like similar to like a horror movie. Hmm. And I, I like that idea and that principle. And if they could release it and they make money off it, so be it, man. I yeah. love the idea. So I, I'm really jazzed about it. I want to go see it. Very cool. So uh, the next up would be uh, Disney Plus is moving up with the WandaVision to be a show to come out this new year instead of 2021. So we get this later in the year after Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Which I'm glad of because I've been anticipating this particular show since they announced it on Disney Plus. Yeah, I'm excited for for WandaVision. I'm excited to to see what they what they're going to do with that because it's supposed to be kind of a sitcom kind of version. So it's going to be a, a, you know comedy, but it's going to have Paul Bettany and all the the original actors and stuff. So I'm uh, I'm excited for that one. And I didn't know that. I didn't. I don't think I realized that it wasn't supposed to come out until 2021. So I'm really glad that they're bringing it out earlier because I know there's a lot of right now. People are talking about that uh, with the Mandalorian ending that people are dropping yeah. Disney Plus like flies and because there's nothing else scheduled before like the middle of the year or when is Falcon Winter Soldier Spring 2020? Yeah. You know, so you're you're looking at three, four months before that's going to come out and then there's nothing else except for – some of the movies or stuff, but there's nothing else scheduled to come out until the summer or Mandalorian season two next fall, you know? Yeah, exactly. So I, I think Disney plus is not looking like, Oh, we're going to lose money, but 
they're losing certain amount of subscribers are saying, oh, I can't afford it because there's so much out there. You know, Apple Plus mm-hmm. is out there. I yeah. got it free one recently because I had for a year because I bought an Apple TV. So oh. note to self to everybody else. <laughs> If you bought an Apple product, a new iPhone, uh, like an iPad or something, they are giving you Apple Plus, uh, the channel through Apple TV, free for a year. Hmm. And from the time that you subscribe, it's free until – and you'll have an end date too, so you could actually see it on your iTunes. So you could choose to keep it or not. I believe it's $4.99 a month. But I started watching a couple of shows, and I enjoyed them. The movie, uh, the show C with uh, Jason Momoa is interesting. So I started watching a couple of episodes of that. There is the morning show with uh, Steve Carell and Jennifer Aniston and Reese Witherspoon. I started watching that. I They're very interesting shows. Mm-hmm. So uh, I recommend if you got a new Apple product and you have the means to actually – start going out there and get that. But I think with all the fact that all these companies are coming out with their own streaming services and Disney plus like hit it out of the park when they, when they opened it up back in what October, November, November 12th. Yeah. Yeah. November. But they've been Uh, announcing it for like a year. Like, I mean, like they started announcing it back in 2018 that it was going to be November 12th, 2019 when it, when it actually dropped. And so you had all this anticipation for everything. So, uh, so yeah, that's, that's cool. I mean, I went ahead and did the whole year. I just went ahead and paid the 69 yeah. bucks or whatever it was for the whole year for Disney plus anyway. So it I'm makes sense watching. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for me, there's enough stuff on there that I can check it out and, and see. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's the, the fact is, is I think that they're coming up with more original content now. Mm-hmm. And the fact that people saw the Mandalorian love that. And then they saw a drop and they thought, okay, well, What's the next thing that we have and that we make a lot of money on? And that would be Marvel. And we haven't had a new Marvel show recently. Yes. So they'll just bring in Falcon and a Winter Soldier and then cross it into WandaVision. And then that way, once WandaVision ends, I, I wouldn't be surprised that it goes right into the Mandalorian. That way they keep their audience and their key target audience, you know? Yeah. So yeah. to me, yeah, they've already got me. So come on, I, yeah, I they've already got. Like I said, I've already they've already got me. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna quit it. And and even when my year when my year it gets close to being up, then man, to me back out. So yeah, <laughs> you know. exactly. Yeah, you have to have it. Come on, you exactly. know who doesn't like Baby Yoda? <laughs> Maybe he'll be a Mandalorian. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Uh, the only little other little note that I have would be for comic talk would be the talk about comic book movie fatigue. So let, let's talk about this a little bit. A lot of people have been saying this on the internet. A lot of people have been saying it on YouTube. John Campia did a whole little thing about it and things come in waves. Things have its issues. Uh, the Westerns didn't really leave us. We've had a salt and peppering of Western movies and, during like the 60s and the 70s, we had the spaghetti westerns with uh, Clint Eastwood and all that stuff. And everybody kept comparing uh, comic book movies pretty much the same way. I don't think of it that way. I think that it's just a media, another medium that people will like and enjoy, but a specific group will always adhere to. Kind of like me with The Walking Dead, because Walking Dead's been on for the past 10 years, and zombie movies have been prevalent for, I would say, ever since, uh, what was it? Uh, the 60s, George Romero's zombie uh, movies? It was the, the remake of uh, the Romero movie in the early 2000s. Oh, you mean when it started with the resurgence of zombie yeah, The stuff. resurgence yeah. of the mo- yeah, zombie yeah. stuff. Well, I, and the thing with, with, with like, for me... I, I'm I'm good with the with them slowing it down a little bit because like we know we're gonna get Black Widow um, yeah and then after that it's kind of vague I think I think <laughs> it's out there as far as when things are gonna be released released but we know there's another Doctor Strange movie we know there's another Thor movie right yeah there's um there's probably not gonna be another Avengers movie there's not gonna be another Iron Man movie there we're gonna get at least one more Spider Man movie yeah. Um, so, we'll get Venom, but that will be in Sony's uh, world as still, well as Morbius. It's, so. it's still spread out over 
I mean, they're stretching like to 2023, aren't they? Or 2022 at least. Yeah, they've exactly. Stretched out this this timeline. So I, I I think I think they've done it right in that there's there's not going to be I don't think there's going to be a lot of fatigue for it because there's there's going to be just enough time since Endgame before Black Widow comes out, and they're going to have just a few months, and then we'll have like two or three movies in 2020. Yeah. And we'll have all the TV shows and stuff. So I, I think, I think they're going to, they're going to, I think it's going to spread out well that it's not going to cause a lot of fatigue. I don't think so anyway. I, I think there always will be an audience for it, whether, Absolutely. you know, honestly, uh, there's always going to be somebody. The only thing that I see that might be a downfall from Marvel overall, and it's not a negative one, but they're putting a lot into the Eternals mm-hmm. and, you know, Jack Kirby, when he started the Eternals and he created it, it was a great idea and thought, but there's so much involved with it. Mm-hmm. And they have a big, heavy cast of main actors that are playing in this this movie. Mm-hmm. And to span the idea and thought, this better be like more than a two-hour movie. It's got to be about two and a half, three hours just to explain everything. I know nothing about the Eternals. So yeah, they're Eternals. literally gods in the Marvel universe and they're like the Titans. Hmm. So it explains all that and how uh, the X-Men are created. So that kind of leads into where Marvel is going with this because they have to incorporate the X-Men and uh, a little bit of news of what's going on future in the MCU. Uh, basically what they're looking to do is they're going to incorporate and it's been confirmed that Dr. Doom is going to be the main villain in the Black Panther 2, hmm. which is coming out. And they're seeding other things that are that are going to come out, too, slowly. So I, yeah. I'm hoping that happens. But it, the way that uh, the Marvel Universe started with Iron Man slowly rolled into because we got Iron Man, then we got the Incredible Hulk, and then slowly it went into Thor. And then that's when we got to the Avengers. So if they do the same thing where it's more of a space kind of thing and then incorporate because the end outcome, I think, will be Secret Wars. But that's just my speculation of what's going on. And like I said, they haven't – there's nothing even – you're talking talking three, four years. Yeah, exactly. I I think there's – I think that's – when the question of fatigue, you're you're talking about the stuff that's going to happen really quick. And, and, you know, we're we're looking at – they've got a plan that's going to roll out over the next three years for these next phases. So. Yeah, and Kevin Feige pretty much has that locked down. I think I I don't think the man's stupid. I think he has a good vision. Oh, yeah. And if they continue on and they give Favreau a Star Wars movie or a show, just like the Mandalorian, if he goes into the movies, uh, it's gonna be phenomenal. Yeah. So that that's all I got for comic talk this week, and obviously that led into some pop culture. But <laughs> yeah, well, let's go ahead and wrap up this uh, wrap up this episode for this week. Definitely. So we'd like to give a special thanks to Kirk Manley for our artwork for our podcast. Uh, Basically, check out Kirk Manley on his website, www.studiokm.com. You could follow him on Twitter at BatmanKM, Instagram at BatmanKM, or check out his art at BatmanKM.DeviantArt.com. If you have something that you would like to hire Kirk for, like a consignment, you can email him at kirk at studiokm.com. And for us, if you want to submit your feedback, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, you can hear our podcast on Spotify, Google Play, Apple iTunes, or hopefully wherever you get your whatever your podcast player of choice is. And if you can give us a rating on there, give us a five-star rating uh, and let us know what you think. Uh, you can check out our website at wwwpanels 2 pixelspodcastcom you can also submit your theories and feedback through our Facebook page, which is the, which is facebook.com slash panels to pixels. You can email us at panels to pixels one at gmail.com. That's panels to pixels one. The TO is spelled out right there in the middle and the number one at gmail.com. You can also call us and leave a voicemail at 845 350 Again, that's 845 845- 
Also, subscribe to our new YouTube channel, which is Panels to Pixels Podcast. Is it Panels to Pixels Podcast? Okay. So yeah, just search for panels, search in YouTube for Panels to Pixels Podcast, and you can subscribe, give us a rating on there, give us a, give us a thumbs up, share, uh, whatever you do uh, from YouTube. Definitely. Uh, we That's something that we actually started not too long ago, but uh, I seem to want to add that a little bit more. A lot of people have been viewing and listening that way. So <laughs> if you like to listen to your podcast with your Apple TV or whatever you use to search YouTube on and listen to as it's on your TV, it'd be amazing. So just throw us a thumbs up, subscribe, and leave a comment. That'd be awesome. So there are other ways to listen to us. And for you to listen to me, I am a co-host on The Walking Dead Talk Through with Brian Malosh on The Talk Through Media. So we review The Walking Dead each week. So, Panels to Pixels is on the Next Level Podcast Network, but I am the co-host as well on another podcast network. So, yeah. just follow us there if you love The Walking Dead. Follow us at talkthroughmedia.com and just look for The Walking Dead Talk Through there. You can find us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, right now, we're currently working on a lot of things. Brian right now is working on the Picard cast. And Picard is coming up strongly right now. It's coming up really close. So I might be on the next, uh, on the first episode of that, or uh, maybe before episode. I'm not sure yet. <laughs> so uh, we would love for you guys to listen to it. If you love Star Trek, you'll love Picard. I do. I love Picard. I, I have yet to finish up Discovery. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm definitely going to watch Picard from day one and start, you know, just watch that whole thing and i'm just gonna get my two cents in every once in a while when i can when he does his podcast very cool i uh i submit voicemail feedback to various podcasts that uh that you may or may not listen to on the podcastica network on talkthroughmedia.com and uh on this this uh podcast network next next level podcast network as well so you may hear my voice pop up on various other places awesome so thanks everybody for listening i'm mark and i'm steve and this was Panels to Pixels. Good night, everybody. Good night. Someone call for backup. There's Cisco, thank goodness. I need another genius intellect stat. That's why I'm here. And that is a super doppelganger, which is super weird. Holy all-star squadron. Hi. Hi, how are you? Ralph Dibney, elongated man, ready to help kick butt. Ignore him. It's his first crossover. Listen, the antimatter...